Not fair, John. Not fair. Shouldn't have to follow a beautiful, transparent announcement and uh, family reading one of my favorite passages of Scripture and then uh, the song service that uh, kept me in, engaged throughout. Uh, spirits at work, I'll just try not to get in the way. But I will because, as it turns out, I am a broken cell phone. It turns out that no matter what we do, we end up in the way, and it's hard to be otherwise. This morning in our lesson, which I'll, I'll try to rein in, I, I, I'm not kidding when I say it's one of my favorite passages. We're going to look at Luke, the 15th chapter today. It's the Bible's longest parable and one of my favorite. Um, I've written a fair bit. I'm actually have a published journal article on this passage, which I'm going to do my best to not read verbatim uh, from the pulpit today. But it's it's a passage I've done a lot of background on, and so when you preach on a passage like that, the sermon is more about what you leave out than what you put in, because there's so much to say. So I had to pick something and say, what is the thing that I want to communicate today that's going to matter? And the word in the sentence above on the screen that I want us to really pay attention to is the word I. Quite often, Christian sermons are about humility and telling you to forget yourself, which is very important. But today will be an exception to that rule. I want you to remember yourself very much because today we're going to talk about sinners, and I am one of those. When we say, I am a broken cell phone, I want you to emphasize the word I. Say it with me this morning. I am a broken cell phone. Too often when we read the scriptures, we believe it's talking about somebody else. One of my dearest and favorite books uh, that changed my life was a little book called Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, Wonderful text that I go back to quite often. And he has a paragraph where he talks about the right and wrong way to read the Bible. And I was thinking of it this morning. Often the difference between an experienced Christian and the novice becomes clearly apparent. It may be taken as a rule for the right reading of the scriptures that the reader should never identify himself with the person who is speaking in the Bible. It is not I that am angered, but God. It is not I giving consolation, but God. It is not I admonishing, but God admonishing in the scriptures. I shall be able, of course, to express the fact that it is God who is angered, who is consoling and admonishing, not by indifferent monotony, but only with inmost concern and rapport, as one who knows that he himself is being addressed. It will make all the difference between right and wrong reading of the scriptures if I do not identify myself with God, but quite simply serve him. When we read the scriptures... There is an I there, but it's rarely the person speaking. It's always the person being spoken to. Keep that in mind, because I think it's the principal message of the story of the prodigal son. It begins in chapter 15, 11 through 13. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided the property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. It's nearly impossible to read that passage without looking at that son and saying, shame on you, foolish son, and to think of him as that other person. But that person is me. That person is every one of us who looks at the Father and disregards the profound blessings he has instilled in our lives and instead squanders the goodness of God on selfishness. This son has already committed the sin that's going to lead to his downfall and destruction, but the consequences are a long way off, and because of that, he's able to forget that this story is actually about him. I am broken, and I just don't know it yet. Before you hit the bottom, there's always a moment where you feel like things are going fine. In fact, usually several of them, where you feel like you've been really clever, and then the circumstances begin to change. The next passage reads, and when he had spent everything, 
A severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. He took his possessions, he took what he had taken from his father, what had been granted him, and he starts to spend it, and he's buying a little freedom from conscience. He's buying a little release from trouble and anxiety and all the concerns that are eating him up inside. He spends his money and he enjoys himself and he doesn't have to think about himself or his life. But here's the thing. I'm broken and I don't know it yet. I'm broken and eventually my consequences catch up with me. My choices catch up to me. Circumstances change. Sin doesn't endure. And so as he goes to the far country, he spends what he has, and eventually he has to recognize what he's made of himself, a young man very much alone and cut off from every goodness in his life. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. He said, I'm in his field to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be filled with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Young man who had lived a a surely entitled life, who had had every blessing at his disposal, had then taken all of that and squandered it, the young man finds himself in a situation where he has to not only work for a living, it gets pretty nigh to begging, right? Slopping hogs, not really romantic business. He's out there in a field, a young man doing the dirtiest of dirty work, just trying to get by. And at every moment, he has to know, somewhere in the back of his head, that he could go home. Like, that's an option. But it doesn't occur to him yet to actually do that. Because in his pride, he believes he still has this under control. See, this is what keeps us in sin. Our pride tells us that we're not a broken cell phone that we're not sinful and destroyed, that we're not mangled and diseased. Our pride tells us that this is just a little hiccup in the great big story of Ben Williams. Everything's going to be fine and everything's going to get better. This is just the heroic low spot in the story that I'll overcome and triumph. You know, there's a little famine, I'm a little hungry, but it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine. And we keep telling ourselves that, and our pride leads to our shame. We find ourselves slopping hogs in the pig pen, humiliated because we were too proud to acknowledge we had humiliated ourselves already. We are unwilling to acknowledge what we've done to ourselves, and because of that, we dig that hole a little deeper. There's a beautiful moment in this story where the young man comes to himself. The prodigal son story is a story about repentance. But the way it's told is just masterful. The word repentance is never used in the parable. Okay, Quite often, Jesus uses the word repent. In fact, if you read Luke 15, he first tells the story of a hundred sheep and one is lost. And he says, such is the story of one who repents and comes home. Then he tells the story of ten coins and one is lost. And then he says, such is the joy of one that repents and comes home. But in the final parable of the chapter... He never uses the word repent. He just describes it. This is what repentance looks like. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He came to himself. Sin tells us that this version of ourselves is who we really are, that what we really crave is freedom from rules and restraints. What we really crave is independence. And if I can get away from all of your rules and expectations and do what I want, then I can be who I really am. It's a lie. That's not who you are. Who you are is a child of God made in his image. And you are not your best self until you are restored to that. Until you are a child in the family of your father. And that's what the young man realizes. Who am I? I'm not the young man who is wealthy. I'm not the young man who is wasteful. I'm not even the young man slopping hogs. I am my father's son. And that's where I should be. And he comes to himself, and he says, even being a servant in my father's house would be better than being this wretched creature I have turned myself into, wandering so far away. 
And so he does what all of us do when we have something hard to do. Everybody do this? I hope you do. I hope I'm not the only one. We rehearse a speech, right? When you have something really humiliating you have to say, you practice it. He says, so here's what I'm going to do. And he's talking to himself. Isn't this great? He's talking to himself. He says, I'm going to go home, and here's what I'll say. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He believes that the identity he had is now lost to him. He was a son, and then he was a vagabond, and now he hopes maybe he can be a servant. And so he's going to go home, and he rehearses his speech. Can you imagine how many times on the way home, because it's a far country, is what the text says. There's a lot of walking on the way home. And you know, when you're by yourself and you get to talking to yourself, you can have these conversations in your head. And on the way home, how many times did he rehearse his speech? Father, I have sinned against you and before heaven. Now he's going to be one of your servants. Father, I have sinned against you. And how many times had he rehearsed his little speech? Fact is, I am broken, but I'm not hopeless. Even in his broken estate, even in his sad and fallen situation, there's one thing that could never be taken away. There was a place to go home to. There was a place where he believed he could still go. He didn't believe he'd be welcome there. He thought he'd have to do some begging, but he believed there was such a place. And he makes his journey home with his beautiful little rehearsed speech. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The text describes the father to us who's the only hero in the story. The father is our God. The father is this beautiful character and you can imagine what he's doing. He's scanning the horizon every day. He doesn't know where his son is. His son is just gone out there in the far country somewhere, far too far for him to go and find him. So he does the next best thing. He sits on his porch day after day, and he's not worried about his crops or his fields or his livestock. He is looking every day at the horizon. How many days had he looked and gone to bed and nothing had happened? But that day, that one day, he looked, and there comes his wayward son over the hilltop. And so what does he do? Well, he folds his arms and he says, oh, this is going to be good. No, it's not what he does. Do you understand? Everybody who had heard this parable up to this point, it's a tragedy, by the way, to be us today, because we've heard this story before. It's impossible for you ever to hear the prodigal son's story for the first time again. But if you could pretend and take yourself back 2,000 years and hear it for the first time, Nobody knows how the story ends, but everybody thinks they do. Everybody thinks this is where the very smug father gets to tell the radical, childish son, now you're in for it. Come down here and beg a little bit, and maybe I'll make you a servant, and you'll get what's coming to you, and all will be right in the world. That's the expectation of the story. But that's not the father that Jesus Christ knows or wants to tell us about. He looks, and he watched every day, and he ran to him. Great old book you can't find in print anymore titled, Does God Still Run? And it's a book about Christian love and evangelism and the fact that we serve a God who isn't waiting for us to come home, but when he sees us coming over the hill, runs to us with compassion, embraces us. Do you understand the significance of that? It would have been perfectly fair to read the Old Testament scriptures and when a prodigal son shames his father, you're supposed to pick up a rock and throw it at his head. The Old Testament scriptures line out the details of what to do to a son that shames his father, and the penalty is as high, of, as, high as death. This father runs and throws his arms around the son and says, if you're going to throw a rock at him, you're going to hit me. And he hugs him and he kisses him. If you're a nerd for a minute and go read this in the Greek text, it's actually not just the word kiss, it's the word kissed him a lot. <laughs> kissed him all over his face. I mean, embarrassment. What your mother did when she dropped you off on the first day of school and you said, Mom, that's what he did. Kissed him all over his face, hugged him, and adored him. Well, this isn't what the son was expected, so he has to kind of rearrange himself because this is not what was, should have happened. 
He was broken and he should have been despised. He was broken and he should have been hated. He is broken, but he's loved. And so am I. That's okay. He's got a speech to make. And he said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please. And then he gets interrupted. Don't miss that part. The speech had another line. In the next line of the speech, the son had rehearsed it all the way here. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Take me on as one of your servants. And the father is having none of it. The son gets these words out of his mouth. Father, I have sinned. And the father cuts him off and says, that's plenty. No, no, I've practiced. This is where I grovel. And the father says, not at all. We're not going to hear you say, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Fact is, you never were and it never mattered. Sonship isn't about worth. It's about love. And so the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him and put a ring on his hand. The ring is the symbol of identity, the symbol of the family crest that marks him as the son and the heir. Put it on his hand. Put shoes on his feet. The masters wear shoes. The servants go barefoot. Put shoes on the young man's feet. He's family again. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. I'm lost, but I am welcomed home. I stared at this slide for quite a long time, having one of those perverse preacher moments where I was trying to decide on verb tense. Do I want to say, I'm welcome home, or I will be welcomed home, or I am welcomed home? And I landed on welcomed because the welcomed mat is already out. You understand? God has already welcomed me home. I don't have to get there and convince him. That's the point of the rehearsed speech, right? Father, I have sinned before heaven and earth, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I rehearse my speech because I know I'm in trouble, and I'm hoping if I grovel enough you will open the door and say, come on in. You understand? That's my best hope. (laughs) My highest, most outlandish hypothetical is that if I grovel enough, you might pretend to love me again. And what the parable says is he loved you before he got home. He loved you when you left home. He loved you when you came home. He loved you when you stayed home. You were welcomed before you were there, and that door was never closed. It was always open. It'd be a really good parable if it stopped there and it'd be easier to preach. But somehow it gets better and it gets worse all at the same time. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, well, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. But when his son, the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Side note for, for good reading. The, the elder son, he's a bit dramatic. Okay? He really is, and he's like us in that way. The older son, he doesn't just like, come in and then privately say to his father, hey, I, have some, I have some legitimate concerns I'd like to air. He won't even come in the house. He's on the outside looking in with his arms folded, and dad comes out and says, what's the problem? He says, well, look, like he hadn't seen it, right? Look. These many years, you know, it couldn't be, you know, I've, I've been here. No, lo, these many years I have served you. He had nothing to gain from it, right? He was just dutifully a, a good servant son. And I never disobeyed your command. I can't even get through that with a straight face. Come on. Some of you are sons and daughters. I think you had parents, most of you. Anybody here straight out of the test tube? I don't know. All of you had, were a child at some point. Raise your hand if you can look at your parents in the face today and say, I have never disobeyed your... Lightning will come down. Right? 
I know what he meant. He means I was a pretty good son, but he's a liar. I never disobeyed your command. Yes, you did. You just didn't do that. But you did something. Come on. But you never gave me a young goat. Any sentence with the word never in it is usually a lie, just to let you know. Nobody ever nevers or always, okay? It is not the way it works. You never gave me the fat and calf. Yeah, nothing ever good. Have you ever noticed that in arguments that everything is always never and always? You never listen to me and you always do this and you never gave me anything. It's so dramatic. You never, never gave me. And now this son of yours, did you catch that? I've heard that one before from my wife. <laughs> when my son misbehaves, he's not, he's suddenly not our wonderful child. It's this, your son. Right. And that's what the, the brother says. Not angry mother. The brother says, this son of yours, not my brother. I don't even know who he is. He's done all these, and even that is dramatic. Do you know what the older brother, assuming he is telling the truth, that he stayed home on the farm all his life being a servant, do you know what the older brother knows about what the son has done, the younger brother in the far country? Nothing. But in his head, he's got it all figured out. Well, there were prostitutes and parties and all kinds. I know what he was up to. So dramatic. So bitter. And so angry. And the father says, son... You were always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Did you catch that? Don't miss it. This son of yours, Dad says, your brother. The family relationship is still honored and intact. And in fact, he's giving the older brother a choice. Because at this moment, there's a party going on inside the house. And the younger son, the one we call the prodigal, has gone inside. The older brother is outside, complaining. Your brother's in the house. Your father's in the house. Are you going to be part of this family or not? This, your brother, Here's the story of the prodigal son, the one we always miss. I am broken, and I still think this story was about somebody else. And that's why Jesus kept telling the story. You get to the end of the first prodigal son, and you say, yeah, those sinners ought to come home. Go get them today, preacher. But Jesus says, you have completely missed the point. This parable was never about that other guy. You are not supposed to read this parable as a father graciously letting his children come home. You're the sinful child. There was a man who had two sons and they were both lost. One lost in a far country, one lost at home, but both of them were lost. Only one of them knew it. This story is not about somebody else. Today, this parable is told to sinners all around the world, lost in addiction, trapped in sin and fear. And this parable is also told to sinners all around the world, attending their Sunday morning worship service, singing their songs and saying their prayers, sitting in their pews with the smugness of false righteousness. This story is about me because one way or the other, I am a broken cell phone. I am in need. And I have to be called home. There are two prodigal sons in this story. And I'm one of them. And until I recognize who I am in the story, I cannot know who God is. God is the father that called both sons home. You come into the house. You come into the house. Everybody into the house. You are a sinner being called home. Because your God loves you and that's who he is. It never depended on you. It never has and it never will. It's his love opening that door every day. Our Father and our God, we come to you today in prayer. I come to you as a sinner 
speaking to sinners. Help us to recognize our place before you, that we have sinned before you and before you alone. Help us to come home. Whether we are far or near, know that we are too far. Help us to come home by the blood of your Son who died for me. As we pray in his name, amen.